All right. So I'll move through my notes, and then from there we'll jump into our, our fishbowl for the day. Um, so oh, real quick. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm on my phone right now. Um, could you break down the crime bill a little bit more? Um, the crime bill from talking about with Clinton. Yeah, the 1964. Uh, 60, well, the crime. Oh, no, bill, was, so the 64 was a voting rights bill. The crime bill was, I want to say, 93 to 95 in that era. Um, essentially, that was so in California. You know, you have like the three strikes law. That was something that was, signed, that was signed by by Clinton. Um, also, like uh, mandatory minimums for drug offenses. That's something that was signed by Clinton. Um, also backed by Joe Biden, he was also a large proponent of, the, of that crime bill. So due to this crime bill, a large percentage of the um, in prison incar incarcerated population, excuse me, are black, right? And a large, and this is directly tied to that crime bill. So when you see like lack of fathers and things like that in, in black households, this is a direct result of that crime bill. Does that provide a little bit more context for you? Yeah. Okay. All right. Bet. So let, let's move through my notes. Um, I think no one would argue, right, that this idea or this notion of, of black nationalism takes center stage in this speech. Um, before we go too far into this idea of black nationalism, let's just deal with nationalism for a little bit. Um, so I, I ask you all, when you hear this term nationalism, what kind of imagery, um, what kind of thoughts or ideas pop in your head when you hear nationalism? There's no wrong answer. Anybody could chime in. Just what do you think when you hear nationalism? Or what is nationalism? How would you articulate what nationalism is? Supporting your own country. Support for your own country. So let's, um, let's focus in on that. And I think with that being said is why a lot of people would assume that this idea of nationalism has a negative connotation. Um, if you think back to uh, maybe three or four summers ago, you had the Tiki Torch protest, um, the cats and khaki saying that you will not replace us, right? That's an interpretation of some form of nationalism. If you think about last January, um, the folks storming the Capitol, right? That could be understood as some form of nationalism. So by and large, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, in our society, nationalism is typically understood as something that is problematic. Would you agree or disagree with that statement? Agree or disagree, nationalism has a problematic connotation. It can, I believe. It depends on where the nationalism is rooted, because in some parts you can celebrate culture, whether it's food. And I don't really see how food could be problematic, but in the sense where it's like less about nationalism and more about imposing, uh, I guess, their status and preserving their the privilege and the status. And it's not so much as, oh, you never replace us. We don't want to lose our, our, our uh, I guess, our, our majority of the population being white because then we lose our privilege. Yeah, it's a, it's a very nuanced understanding of this concept. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you all, and, and be honest with you, legit question. When you heard Malcolm talking about this idea of Black nationalism, when you first heard him mention it, what were your thoughts? Did you pick up on a negative connotation also? Or I just, what, what were your thoughts when you heard it? Somebody please respond. I'm very curious to know. I got you. Um, cause I messed up earlier, but, um, the way I perceived it is some, is a bit different from how, when I hear white nationalism, when I hear black nationalism, it's more of let's remove ourselves from this white space and have more of this independence. Cause that's so much what the main thing was. There's two schools that like with, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He wanted us to like work with the white man, but let us work together to build something together. But with Malcolm and the BPP, it was more so all right, we've had enough. Like we want to be in our own communities, ran by our own community, and we want to kind of remove ourselves from you guys. Let us, let y'all do you. We'll do us. We just want to make sure that we have the tools we need to set up, and you won't be hearing from us. We got it. Perfect. Did anyone else have a, a different and different, excuse me, interpretation outside of what Mac just articulated? 
So y'all thought exactly what he thought? Because I mean, I, I don't think that's the average person is going to come up with that interpretation. I'm not saying that he's wrong. Just to be honest, though, I don't think the average person thought that. Um, David, would you agree with uh, Max's interpretation, or did you have a separate interpretation? Oh, you know, I'm sorry, David. Your 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 mic, your mic is off. Okay, so I'll put that on pause. We'll we'll move forward. Um, so this idea of, of nationalism, right? He's saying I'm going to set aside your religious affiliations, right? We're going to set aside our political affiliations, right? Um, to Brianna's point, we're even going to set aside this notion of us being American, right? We're going to put our blackness at the forefront of all of our um, happenings, right? So if we're going to do something from a standpoint of politics, we're thinking about black politics. If we're going to talk about economics, we're talking about black economics, right? Everything else becomes secondary. This is, to me, is the same work that Pan-Africanism seeks to do. Instead of it being blackness that's the center, right? It's your Africanity that's the center. So we're going to focus on how we're all connected through this notion of us being tied to Africa, right? So I see a similarity within B Malcolm's articulation of black nationalism and the work that Pan-Africanism Pan seeks to do. And he says with this black nationalism must come a re-education, right? You must re-educate the, the black masses to place their focus on black nationalism, right? To um, place their economic focus on these ideas of black nationalism. And I, I want to um, do focus in and zoom in for a moment on this notion of economic independence. So we know from reading and listening to this speech that this speech is given after he has left the Nation of Islam, right? But the Nation of Islam is very much informing this speech. Because if you know about the Nation of Islam, and you know that they were located in Chicago, right on the south side of Chicago, they had a very strong economic power base in Chicago. Businesses, uh, bakeries, tailors, um, restaurants, right? Very strong economic power base. So when Malcolm is talking about black folks having this economic power, he's not just making shit up. Like he's seen this happen, right? He's seen the amount of money that black folks were able to raise through the Nation of Islam, right? He says, if you were to take this and broaden this idea for all black folks to move like this, then we would have an economic power that the world would have to recognize, right? So this comes behind this idea of re-educating. But again, he's not just pulling this from nowhere. He's seen this happen through the work of Elijah Muhammad in the Nation of Islam in Chicago, right? So there's a practical application to what he's espousing in his speech. It's also a speech of self-help, a speech of agency, right? He's bringing up international questions of liberation, right? It's not just focusing on black folks here in America. He's attentive to the, to the anti-colonial struggles in Africa and Vietnam and elsewhere. He also goes through a part of the speech where he's just naming off the um, losses of colonial powers, right? Who can tell me what a neoliberal is? Or if you're familiar or you've heard of the term neoliberal. I have not, but um, I mean, I've heard the term, but I really haven't looked into it, but based off what I'm hearing, like neo typically is referred to new. So the typical liberal probably back then was diff very different from how like the neoliberal is today, where it's more aggressive, more uh, direct, more, um, how's the word I'm thinking of, but just almost like screaming for change and acting on it so much as how like riots and protests and just more, much more active, I guess. So you're absolutely right, Mac. So when you, anytime you hear neo, it's new, right? Neo-colonialism, a new form of colonialism. Um, so if we are to take that as is, then we could deal with the term liberal, right? And if we think from a political standpoint, you have your conservatives, which is typically your Republican party. Um, they're, they're, they're thought about as being on the right, right? Then you have more of your radicals who are thought of being on the left, 
people like your anti fighter, um, things of that nature. So more to the left, but not all the way to the left of the radicals, you have your liberals. Those are understood to be like your Democrats. Um, if you think about um, summer of 2020, um, you had like a lot of these people, um, senators, um, throwing on their little daishiki cloth and then going out to the, to the um, Senate offices or whatever, taking a knee and putting their fist up to show the solidarity for Black Lives Matter, right? This is a neoliberal act to show that they're in support of things and movements like the Black Lives Matter, like the civil rights movement, right? But when it comes down to actually signing paperwork and legislations that shows the support for these communities, rarely does that happen, right? So Malcolm has a very keen critique of neoliberalism and is manifest through his understandings of the March on Washington, where he says they have you marching between one dead man, Abraham Lincoln, another dead man, George Washington, singing We Shall Overcome, right? And if you know the history of the March on Washington, it was designed originally to be a very radical, very boisterous um, denouncing of the wars, um, denouncing of, of capital interests, the, the neoliberals come in and they really watered down the whole message of the March on Washington to the point every speech that was given on that day had to get checked and authorized by a neoliberal, right? So he, he's very critical of these neoliberals. I also want to think, I want you to think about um, what Max said in the sense of, you know, the Black Panther Party and Malcolm kind of being in the same line of, 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 of um, happenings. Also with Rohan saying from a musical standpoint, when you hear the, the uh, rawness of the hip hop in the 80s and 90s, they follow this trajectory of Malcolm's thinking. What Malcolm is doing is very similar to what Baldwin is doing in the sense of, think about last reading that we had, I know it was two weeks ago, but the fire next time, right? And the fact that he's offering this prophecy in the sense of through the work of, of, of Noah, right? God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. So if they don't get their shit together, God's going to come back with the fire, right? Malcolm's up to the same thing. You have the ballot, the political means of addressing our grievance, the, um, the way that's Represent, not represented, but recognized, right, and authenticated through um, popular culture. Then you have the bullet on the other hand, the way that's deemed more irresponsible, more radical, right? Not um, representative of the proper way to do things. Malcolm is saying, if y'all don't want to listen to us, offer it through the means of the ballot, you're going to have to deal with this bullet, right? This is prophe this prophecy coming to fore, right? Same thing that Baldwin's doing. Um, but he's also saying, if we are going to make this ultimatum of the ballot or the bullet, black folks, we need to be more politi politically astute, a little bit more politically mature in how we cast our vote. It cannot be the circumstance to where you're voting for someone based on a promise, and then that individual gets in the office and they never fulfill their promise, i.e. Joe Biden, right? We have to be more politically mature. He says, it's so divided. America's so divided in the means of the vote. He's speaking in 1964, right? When black folks vote in a block, when a black folks vote, vote organized, they are the swing vote. They're the determining factor, factor as to who gets put in the White House and who goes to the doghouse, as what Malcolm says, right? So we must see this and be aware and intelligent about where we cast our vote and ensure that whoever we put in office is going to be able to fulfill those promises. He also makes the claim that the Dixiecrats and the Republicans are two sides of the same coin, right? Um, the Dixiecrats are your Southern Democrats, okay? Another thing to keep in mind, um, there was a time where the Republicans and the Democrats were flipped in the way that the Black citizens viewed them, right? So back in the day, the more favorable party to black folks was the Republican Party. The more um, damaging party to black folks was the Democratic Party, right? But then you also have the, the divide between the North and the South, right? 
And he's saying, Malcolm, that don't get it confused and think that these Democrats and these Republicans, that either of them are in your corner. They're both two sides to the same coin, right? And he says, you know, I know y'all don't want to hear this, but I'm going to tell you the truth whether you like it or not. And to me, this is a, per, a, a very important component about who Malcolm X was. The truth guided a great deal of his decision making. The truth is what allowed him or forced him to move away from the nation of Islam, right? Once he understood that the things that the nation said that they were about, they weren't doing, he had to go his separate ways because it was the truth for him that guided his decision making. Um, towards the latter years of his life, Malcolm X picks up this project of taking the United States to the United Nations for um, human rights violations. Ask you guys a question. Black Lives Matter, the same, not the organization, the same. Black Lives Matter. What does that mean to you? What are they getting you to think about through the articulation of this notion that Black Lives Matter? What are your thoughts? What do you think that What do you think that means? Black Lives Matter. What does that mean? You don't have to be too deep or esoteric. Just what do you think Black Lives Matter means? What are they trying to bring to attention? Go ahead, Karina. I think it's just like the social movement of like um, fighting racism and the like bringing awareness towards like the police brutality. Okay. So let's let's put the social movement aside for now. Let's just focus on that term, right? The three words, Black Lives Matter. What does that term say about the environment, the community, the society that produced it? If you have to say that Black Lives Matter, that means by default, what? That there's an implication that like there's a belief that they didn't matter to begin with. Exactly. Exactly, Rohan. Thank you. So if you have this, if you have a movement that's organized around this notion that black lives matter, that means that you exist in a society where black lives don't matter. Okay? Check where I'm going with this. The civil rights movement was about what? Somebody tell me some of the main components of the civil rights movement. What were the things that they were fighting for? Obviously, a civil rights, but what type of civil rights? What was one of the core components of the civil rights struggle? One of the words starts with an I. Integration, right? Integration, where to go to school, where to go to work, the ability to sit in a certain part of the bus, the ability to ride on certain... Um, trains, right? So these are the focal points of the civil rights movement, okay? The civil rights movement is about how you live your life, about the quality of life that you're able to live, and not limiting one's quality of life because of their color, okay? This is vastly different from saying that Black lives matter, right? Because what the civil rights movement is saying, it's like, yeah, we... We're not arguing that our lives matter. We're just saying, let us live a life that is equal to the way that you live your life, right? So we fast forward to 2020s, the 2020s, 2010s, right? And the conversation now becomes about just your life mattering. So not about the quality of your life, but just about your ability to live a life, okay? So... Is that a human rights issue or a civil rights issue? I'm asking. Is Black Lives Matter a civil rights issue or a human rights issue? Uh, 
What do you think, Karina? You think it's a civil rights or human rights? Gisela, put it, um, what do you think? Is it a human rights issue or a civil rights issue? Black Lives Matter. It's a human right issue. Carlos, what do you think? Human rights or civil rights? If you can't talk, just put it in the chat. David, same for you, please. Do you think it's a human rights issue or a civil rights issue? Black Lives Matter. If you can't say it, just put it in the chat for me. Um, so put it in the chat, Carlos. David, you as well, please. If you can't say it, just put it in the chat what you think, human rights or civil rights. Uh, Rohan, hum human rights or civil rights? I think both in some ways because Explain. there's some laws that have to do with um, like there's some laws that, uh, as mentioned in the video, like allow cops to get away with killing innocent people, like the stand your ground law. So I think that I think politics kind of factors into it as well, like what allows them to do that on a like legal level. But obviously, human rights are at play too. Okay, I I think we're all in agreement that it's a human rights issue, right? So I question in the organizing efforts of groups like Black Lives Matter, why do they proceed if it's a civil rights issue, right? So a lot of the things that you've seen in the civil rights movement are still being picked up in today's movement, right? But the fight is different. Even in the language of the movement, the fight becomes vastly different, right? So what sense does it make to take human rights issues and address them as if they're civil rights issues, right? This is what Malcolm was trying to do. And that's why, again, as I mentioned, towards the end of his career, towards the end of his life, he's focusing on taking the United States to court to the United Nations for violations of human rights. And this is what he seeks to do. Um, he's also shifting his ideas around movements for like in, things like integration, whereas in the past, he would have a very negative outlook and, and speak very damaging, damning, excuse me, speak very damning on those who advocated for notions of integration to where once he separated from the nation of Islam, once he went on his Hajj and he comes back and he doesn't view them the same as in the sense that they're not doing what's necessary for our liberation, he more so views them as one method to accomplish our liberation while he's working on another method. But at the end of the day, the objective is the same and that's our liberation. So that's an evolution in, in, in the thinking of Malcolm X. And I think the way that he ends the speech is another nod to this notion of Pan-Africanism, um, to a Pan-African Pan -African solidarity, which I think is very important. And as um, um, David kind of, no, sorry, not David. Um, um, Rohan kind of uh, mentioned, as, as well as Mac, like it starts this line of thinking that you see within the Black Panther parties and would ultimately, would ultimately inform the thinkings of a lot of rappers in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, so I'll put, I'll put a pin on my notes there. Um, we'll move into our fishbowl. Um, you should all know where you stand with your fishbowl. If you went twice, you know you're good for the semester. If you went once, you have one more. If you have not went, you should probably do so um, soon. Um, you could talk about your journals. You could talk about your breakout rooms. You could talk about the video that was played, or you could talk about what was discussed um, in my notes. Is there anyone who wants to volunteer for the fishbowl? All right. Um, if I call your name and you went twice, just let me know and, and we'll keep it moving. Uh, Mac, are you prepared to fishbowl or have you went twice already? I went twice already. All right. Um, Carlos, are you prepared to fishbowl or have you went twice already? Okay, Karina, I got you. Oh, and you know, Carlos, I think your your thing is broke. Um, okay, and you, and you went twice. Um, we have you down, Karina. Gisela, have you went twice already? No, I haven't, but okay. I'll go. Okay, Sorry. Yeah. Um, David, I know you can't use your mic. Um, Rohan, have you went twice already? I want to say you have. Yes. Okay, so we'll just go with uh, Karina and Gisela. So whoever wants to set, start that off, it's on you.
So Karina or right, go ahead. Oh, I'll go. So um, as you were saying about um, Black Lives Matter being like a human rights issue, I I said human rights, but also I like thought back, and it's also civil rights because it's a matter of being like equal in a society, and not like it's it's obviously human rights, but with civil rights, it's just more politics and just like the laws in a society. Mm -hmm. So maybe like a human rights issue with civil rights elements. Yeah. Um, yeah, because like, if, although like in the past, how whites had more of a priority and, and um, how do I say, it? more freedom, Mm -hmm. it's it's within a society and it's just unfair and not right perfect thank you um, it's how we build like a society yeah the society is built on this inequality is, is that what you're saying yeah yeah absolutely um cool thank you karina uh, i think that it is more like human rights because it's like it's entitled like um how can I put this? Like, everyone is entitled to the rights without discrimination. So I believe like it's more human rights than, um, yeah. I just I just believe that it's more of like human rights. Uh, yeah, I agree. But what I, what I do want to do just to make sure that we're we're clear, right, and, and clear on this distinction between human and civil. Um, human is dealing with the ability to live right it's the ability just to breathe there's a human rights issue if that is being impacted then we're dealing with human rights violations civil rights is determining on your quality of life so even a law like stand your ground although it's legislation right although it's a law that's a law that is a in violation of certain individuals human rights okay on the flip side of that is a law that's also designed to protect someone's human rights. Because what that law says is, if someone is to come into my home without my permission and they're seeking to do me harm, I have the human right to defend myself and to defend my home, right? So again, even though this is legislation, right? Even though this is something that's on the law, this is a human rights law, right? Um, the anti-Asian hate law that was passed a couple months ago, right? That's law, but that's about the prevention of harm done against people who occupy Asian bodies. So that's a law that is to protect the human rights of Asian people, right? So just because it's a law doesn't necessarily mean that it's a civil rights issue. Does everybody understand like the line of delineation that I'm drawing here, the difference between the civil rights and the human rights? Yes, no, kind of. Okay. So it, it, it's, very, um, it's very important that you understand that distinction. Um, one second. Check time here. We, we're out at 1.30, is it? Yeah, okay. Um, bet. So uh, just curious, was who was able to like listen to the speech and then also read the speech? Is anybody able to do that? And if so, what were the differences that you had um, just reading it to yourself and then hearing Malcolm speak? Um, can you kind of tap, put a little bit of the distinction in the chat for us, Dave, and I, and I could say it out loud to the class? But I think this is very important, right? Because the section that we're in right now, right? So last section was like folklore and storytelling, right? This section is about orality, the ability to orate. And a large to do with oration is it has to be heard, right? So that's why for me it's important for you guys to be able to engage this text in listening to what, um, what Malcolm was saying and how Malcolm said it, right? Um, the passion, if you will, that kind of comes through when you hear it. Um, one could argue the anger that comes through when 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 he when when you hear it, so just looking at the chat, uh, David said, "I feel when I read it to myself, it didn't make so much of an impact, but once I 
heard it, it did because of the voice and the tempo of his voice. I, I want you guys to be very attentive to what he's saying far as the tempo of the voice. Where is Malcolm X located out of? What is his area that he does most of his work? Does anyone know? What part of New the work? I'm sorry, go ahead, Ron. New York. New York, okay. So, has anybody heard of the, te the term a New York Minute? Has anybody heard of that phrase before? A New York Minute goes by in a New York Minute. What do you think that means? Something happens in a New York Minute. What does that connotate? What do you think that means, Mac, for something to happen in a New York Minute? Can you say it one more time? What do you think it means when someone says that happened in a New York Minute? Oh, um, that happened faster than how it might typically happen. So the pace of New York is fast, right? On the flip side, what does it mean when you say wait a cotton pick in second? What do you think that means, Matt? Wait a cotton pick in second. Mm -hmm. Damn. I feel like, uh, not to break it down necessarily, but like if I was to use that term, I'd probably use it in regard to hold the phone, relax, like slow it down, like what's going on? Slow it down. The thing about it, right? Like if, if you picking cotton, and then in the circumstance that people were forced to pick cotton, even a second is going to seem like a whole ass day, right? So you're right in the sense that it happens very slow, okay? So think about the spatiality of what I'm talking about. New York being the north, right? Things are happening quicker, okay? The south being slow, right? I spent some time in the south. Even fast food happens hella slow, right? But I bring this up to talk about the tempo of the speech. So Malcolm is moving. His speech has a rapid tempo. When we get into next week's material, we're going to deal with Martin Luther King and check the tempo of his speech. His speech pattern is very slow. It's very drawn out. It's very rhythmic. It's very like a preacher in a pulpit, right? Because Mount, I'm sorry, Martin Luther King is from where? The South, right? So his audience has a certain way of hearing things. It has to come out a certain way that's a little bit slower than what you are used to and accustomed to from those in the North, right? So David's understanding of this idea of tempo becomes very important as we move into next week's material. Um, speaking of which, let me pull that up so I can show you guys what we have for next week. Um, for those who did not get a chance to listen to the Malcolm X speech, I implore you to go ahead and do it still because a large part of next week's um, discussion will be about comparing the differences between how Malcolm X gives his speech and how Martin Luther King gives his speech. So for next week, we will be... Um, It'll be this one here. I've been to the mountaintop. So for next week's material, it will be the YouTube video, I've been to the mountaintop. There is no reading, it's just the video, I've been to the mountaintop. So that's what we'll um, discuss. But again, if you have not um, listened to the speech given by Malcolm, please do so because a great deal of our conversation next week will be about comparing the styles of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Um, are there any other questions before we call it a day? No. All right. You guys have a good week. Um, be healthy, be wealthy, be wise. And I will see you all next Monday. Peace. You as well. All right, David. Have a good one. Uh, Karina, you good? Yes, I'm good. Thank okay. you. Have a good day. You too.